It is a joy and a pleasure to be moderating this webinar today with really incredible um, organizations and leaders that I've had um, had really the pleasure of working with over the past uh, few years. Uh, so I will start off with introductions. We'll, we'll begin with Erin Sanderson. So Erin is the Senior VP Advancement and Chief Development Officer at Kids Health Phone. Uh, before joining Kids Health Phone in 2020, right before the pandemic hit, uh, um, I will say, Erin uh, uh, spent time in fundraising and, and working in a number of different uh, child and youth related organizations like uh, the PC Children's Hospital Foundation, Plan International, Sick Kids Foundation, and More Child. Erin, uh, it's just so great to have you here and, and really um, it was wonderful to meet you beforehand and, and to just hear how committed you are to, to issues around mental health. Next, we have Mary Deacon. Uh, Mary is chair of Bell Let's Talk, which I think all of us would agree is uh, has just been a formidable force in, in, in reducing stigma and increasing awareness in the area of mental health. She's an incredible leader. She's been a mentor of mine. Uh, she has um, a wealth of experience in mental health, including as chair of the uh, CAMH Foundation. Um, and just really excited to hear what you have to say, Mary, along with Steve Mathias. Steve is just passionate about uh, child and youth mental health. He's a psychiatrist by training. He has worked with some of the most marginalized and difficult to serve populations um, in, in, in Vancouver and the surrounding areas. Um, prior to uh, becoming executive director of Foundry, he co-founded the St. Paul Hospital's Inner City Youth Program. Uh, and as Foundry has just done incredible work uh, to both increase access to care uh, for children and youth in the area of mental health, but also just to really think outside the box on what it means to be really truly youth centered. And I, I personally have had the pleasure of visiting Foundry and, and getting to know Steve uh, firsthand. And um, we're just very lucky to have you working in this field. So, um, so everyone's gonna be very excited to hear from all of you. Um, the topic of this, of this discussion is mental health. And I don't think, um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone. Um, that uh, COVID in particular has, has really increased rates of anxiety and depression in Canada. We're seeing this issue as more prevalent and also getting a lot more attention maybe than it was before, uh, despite the fact that mental health has been a critical issue in Canada for, for many, many years. Uh, so maybe just as an intro question, we'd love to hear from each of you um, about the top issues in mental health today. So feel free to refer to both the current COVID context as we know it, but also in general, you know, any sort of insights you have on the mental health landscape, just to kind of lay the groundwork for this, for this conversation. And maybe I will start with Steve. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, yeah, you know, I think obviously Mary and, and Aaron uh, pipe in with anything, but the um, COVID has been just fascinating to, 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 watch how so many of these issues that have really been there for for years for decades the concerns that we've had around you know the prevalence of mental ill health in young people um you know whether it's one in eight or one in five i mean the, the prevalence is is high particularly when you talk about teens and uh young adults uh the populations that we serve at foundry and obviously kids help phone has some um, a lot of time for as well um but you know i think what we've seen is just an amplification of what was there um before and and i think that what we're starting to recognize and what COVID has highlighted for us more than anything is that there is a huge component of social justice and social injustice that has played into the mental health and well-being of our young people. And for us, and I think to set the table for today's conversation, it's really critical to start talking about how those issues dovetail and how trying to address one you know, just the silo of mental health uh, is probably not going to be nearly as impactful as what we've really come to learn this year, which is the importance of having services that are amenable to and able to pivot and support young people through a whole slew of, of social determinants and if, in particular social injustice. And I think that that's relevant to young people. It's also relevant to adults. 
as relevant to the families that we're seeing. And I think that that's been made really clear. It's been really made, you know, laid barren by, by COVID and all the stresses that it's caused uh, our, our societies. Great, thank you. Erin, do you want to build on that? I know that Kids Health Phone has, has definitely seen a rise in, in demand for service. Can you speak a little bit about the, about the issues that you're, you're hearing about? Absolutely, and I have to totally agree with you, Steve. Um, you know, even to begin with in Canada, we were already at a crisis point with regards to mental health supports for young people. You often hear there's a couple studies that get referenced fairly often that um, one in five people in Canada are experiencing mental health issues, but yet only one in six have access to care. And so you can see that the gap is already there, but um, with respect, to that study and the those professionals that were involved, Kids Help Phone takes the position that we actually think it's far greater than that. It's probably much more like one and one because if it's not you that had been challenged with mental health, it's probably someone in your immediate circle with whom you care for um, that has been experiencing this. And not to be alarmist, but I will also cite that when we compare ourselves as a country to some of the other countries, uh, for example, the OECD nations, Canada has the, prior to COVID, the third highest youth suicide rate out of that whole group. It's followed only by uh, New Zealand and Greenland, and then there's Canada. So we knew prior to entering this, this time that we were challenged as a country and more needed to be done, but of course we know that this pandemic has exacerbated things. In many respects, it's also done so unevenly. So Steve has talked about the social determinants. We know that, for example, um, racialized youth are not accessing care at the same rates as perhaps their Caucasian or white um, peer groups. And so we already have these discrepancies that are now being exacerbated throughout the pandemic. And I will say um, Kids Help Phone is a very privileged or is in a very privileged position to be able to synthesize some of the data that we're receiving in real time from the conversations that we are having with young people every single day to be able to talk about what are some of those issues that are on the rise. And I can tell you that, for example, our conversations about suicide and suicide ideation have dramatically increased. In fact, if we look at just subsets of, of the youth population, in the month of returning back to school of university-aged youth in Canada, we had a 5.4% increase in the conversations about suicide. So we know that the challenges are becoming more acute and more complex every single day. Thank you, Erin. Um... Mary, you know, Bell is working both at the community level and the national level tackling, you know, a range of issues. Can you just share some insights from your perspective on, on what are the key issues in mental health right now? Sure. Thank you, Vanny. Um, you know, I really sum it up by saying, you know, we, what we lack, what we continue to struggle with as a country is timely, culturally appropriate, services that are easy and quick to access. Um, that has, you know, been the challenge, no matter what, what words you use, that really is, there's a, there's a real gap in the availability of these kinds of services. Um, in terms of the landscape, you know, I think the nature of our country being what it is, um, it is uh, healthcare writ large is siloed, it's fragmented. Um, and, you know, as is the case in, in, in my experience with mental health, there are so many people and organizations who, who, who want to be part of the solution to fill these gaps. So, so but there's a lot of duplication. So you have duplication, you have gaps, you have fragmented uh, healthcare system uh, silos, and you have a situation which, which we're certainly very, um, very interested in, and that is there are some wonderful programs um, and, and service models in this country, 
and uh, and yet they are not uniformly available across the country. And one of the things that we are focused on is scaling those best and promising practices. You know, why should people in Nova Scotia uh, be able to get, let's say, the, the services of Str the Strongest Families Institute, let's say, for example, while in the province of Ontario, it's piecemeal here and there. So, you know, we, why aren't programs that are evidence-based available all across the country evenly. Um, and, and so we are funding that and working hard on that uh, uh, with a number of organizations. And, uh, and as well, um, we're very interested as, as um, I think some of you may know in the philanthropic sector in, in, in integrated youth services. And the work that Steve has done, that the Graham Beck Foundation has done um, is extraordinary. Um, and you know, we in the mental health uh, community, I believe, owe a great bit of thanks to the Graham Beck Foundation for getting the integrated youth services movement started. I remember those conversations um, uh, many years ago now, when it was a twinkle in the eye um, of, of Tony Beck and, and how far it has come and, and the work Steve has done in, in British Columbia is, is best in class. And these kinds of programs need to be available in all parts of the country um, with really strong linkages to other evidence-based programs like Kids Help Phone, like um, Strongest Families and others. So there's seamless um, uh, care for, for, in this case, young people um, that is culturally appropriate and easy to access, uh, no wait times. So, um, you know, that's sort of our focus for now and for the foreseeable future is to try and help scale best practices and, and innovation like integrated youth services. Great, thank you. So, um, you know, many of the foundations on this call have been um, funding in the area of mental health for some time, others are, are quite new. Um, would love to hear from each of you on what you believe the role is a philanthropy specifically in advancing mental health and how that relates to both sort of government funding as well as you know the private sector which has has recently made an even more of an entry into this field and maybe we can talk we can start with Aaron this time thanks i'd love to kick things off i think the first place that we need to go to when considering this question is how is that capital different so for example when we think about government funding uh, with exceptions, and I'm going to be painting some broad brushstrokes here, so forgive me that. But that's money that has been part of the public trust. And we want that money to be applied to programs where we have a great uh, deal of confidence that that will be successful. Usually that doesn't come by investing in brand new ideas. Although, yes, there are some uh, examples and exceptions of great government funding to incubate new thinking. But when we think about the capital that we have as philanthropists or as foundations, that may be something that could be invested in an idea that does have some inherent risk, that does have the ability to be much more flexible in taking maybe a different angle based on the learning as that program is rolled out and tried. So maybe what we're looking for is a model where our philanthropic dollars can be used to invest in innovation in trying coordination and this sort of bringing together of the mental health community like Mary had just uh, shared with us in ways that our public dollars might not. Maybe our philanthropic dollars help us prove a program will be successful that we then take to scale with government funding. So I encourage you to think about um, how that money might be different and therefore what's the role that it could play to improve our system as a whole. Great, thank you. Uh, 
Steve, I, you know, as Mary mentioned, your 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 work with the Grand Back Foundation, you're you're quite well versed in 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 partnerships with philanthropy and with government. Can you can you add to some of what Aaron said around around the sort of complementarity between philanthropic funding and, and other sources of funding? Yeah, it, you know, it, it, thanks, Aaron, for for those comments, and and I I, I agree um, in, in many ways that that philanthropic funding um, is um, a, a great opportunity to disrupt, and it's a great opportunity to innovate. Um, I was I was listening though to um, a conversation just last week um, around philanthropy and the role of philanthropy, and and one of the the um, issues was that was raised was really that in times of chaos in times of complexity, it's really, really important that we focus on strengthening a system or strengthening our resolve to, to, um, to, to really get to a solution. And I think that COVID has, in this past year, has really highlighted the importance of us focusing on strengthening our, certain, or our current system of care. Um, there has been innovation, we've seen that. Um, but what has been really lacking, in my opinion, in, in Canada, just like a lot of other jurisdictions, is that there has been a lack of a, a sort of a bridge between policy and government funding and base, the, the implementation of best in class or the implementation of what we know works. So, for instance, we know that bringing services together and integrating is a really, really strong evidence-based model. Um, in fact, you, you know, if you, you go back decades to look at how, you, you know, the early literature in this area talks about the importance of different, you know, service providers working together, working side by side to provide services for um, our clients. Yet, when you look in, at our communities and the way they have been built out over the last 30, 40 years, they've been built out around causes. So you have a housing provider who's over here. You have an income assistance provider who's over here. You have maybe four or five different mental health services. You have a substance use provider who's over here. We did not build our social and health services the way we would if we started with a blank slate. There's no way that we would build this model the way we have. I mean, it's just so siloed to Mary's point, but it's siloed because it's cause-based, it's issue-based. And I think that what we have as a, a, in this moment of chaos and really complex, complex, you know, system, it, we, and it's not, a lot of folks will say that we don't have a system of care, but we do have a system of care. It just doesn't work terribly well. And the reason it's important to recognize that is that if we didn't have a system of care and we were starting with a blank slate, it'd be a heck of a lot easier than what we're, what we're trying to do, which is change management. You know, we're trying to really change the way things are, services are delivered in communities. And in order to do that, you need really strong um, uh, engagement of your end user. So your your, your young people and your family members. You need really strong commitment from the communities. Um, and that's the nonprofit organizations, that's the municipalities, that's the school districts. You need the local health authority. You need the local ministry offices. You also need strong support at the provincial level um, so that you have policy makers understanding the kind of changes that need to happen. And in order to coordinate all this, you need organizations, I think, that are tasked with bringing all those partners together to get them to work together and then to support the implementation of best in class. And I think that that can very well be the sweet spot for, for philanthropy. Yeah. And that's emerging as a partner to really transform, to really disrupt what has been the traditional model in communities. And it's not that it was bad. It's just that that model existed out of necessity. And now we're at this critical point where there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of social injustice, as we've talked about, that we need to address. And in order to take that on, I think philanthropy has a, a real opportunity to interject in that place of coordination and bridging. Great. Thank you. Mary, thoughts on, on, on the specific role of philanthropy? Um, to pick up on what on what you, Steve said, um, I, I really do think we have. This is a moment in time, um, mm -hmm. 
and strategic targeted investments. I mean, first of all, I believe we can all play a role. There's a role for individuals, for corporations, for governments, for sure. Um, and we can all be part of the solution. I believe that very, very strongly. I also believe that we're stronger when we work together. And, and for philanthropy, I believe strategic targeted investments in spreading and scaling evidence-based best practices is something that we can do and we have and we must do and the collaboration and the partnership um, that, that comes with that. I think there's an area as well beyond scaling and, and spreading best practices and that is in the area of data. Um, national indicators across the country uh, about how well we are doing for different populations and different different areas, different regions, different demographics. Um, I don't know that we have that. Uh, uh, well, I know we don't have that data um, across the country in a way that is useful in terms of um, really focusing on what we know is working. So spreading and scaling. Um, that kind of innovation that Aaron talked about in an area where there hasn't been um, uh, widespread, you know, uh, uh, co cohesive collaborative partnership um, would be a bit of a game changer. Um, and, you know, I think about the work that we've been able to do in the MH WAG, which is an expression I adore. Um, and that is uh, the partnerships that have been created to push forward ideas and, and whether they are spreading and scaling, whether they're innovation. Things, you know, we've partnered with, you know, the Graham Back Foundation uh, most, most re recently to help spread and scale integrated youth services across the country. They should be available to every young person in every part of this country, period, full stop. Um, and, uh, but, but we've also partnered with other corporations like RBC and with fa other family kind of fa fa family foundations like the Rossi Foundation with the, with the um, student standard for psychological health and safety. Uh, innovative, but also very, very practical and built into it because of our learnings from the workplace standard um, is, is measurement and outcomes uh, because it's so important to know what is working and what isn't. So yeah, I believe that we have, have can play that targeted strategic role and the kind of exchanges and collaborations and partnerships that come about from sort of cooperative work like that, which is done in, in the MH WAG, is a way for us to sort of each with our own uh, priorities as, as philanthropic organizations to find the points of intersect and work together in those areas. Great, thank you, Mary. Um, you know, so building on that, I think some of the, the terms that we've heard in this call are, are fragmentation, uh, patchwork of services, uh, lack of coordination, silos. Steve, you talked about, you know, a system that was not, um, you know, that was, uh, if we were to recreate it, we would recreate it differently. Let's just put it that way. And and Aaron, you and I earlier on today, were talking about the scarcity mentality um, and, and competition between organizations rather than sort of cooperation and coordination. I would love to hear someone speak to the ways in which funders, be it private philanthropy or others, contribute to those issues and the ways that which we can work differently in order to encourage more, more, you know, more collaboration and, and a more cohesive model. And so, Mary, you talked um, about funder partnerships and, and collaboration. Steve, you talked about um, you talked about, you know, uh, philanthropic organizations as conveners. Aaron, do you have anything you want to add to that about how how funders can work, you know, differently or or can think more strategically about how to how to encourage a more cohesive approach? Absolutely, and I would also I'd start by um, 
encouraging those that are listening today to ask the question because you may there may be much more collaboration that you can't see and that might be a good thing so for taking a, a, a service user uh, folk uh, perspective maybe they shouldn't see the divides between the service that they're accessing or the mm. referrals that are made but that could be happening in the back end between organizations and i think foundry and kids help phone is actually a good example of collaboration that you might not be able to see. So I'd encourage you to be inquisitive around that. But I would encourage you to also ask that question in advance, like what is your philosophy as an agency around collaboration? Point to me what examples that you might have of successful collaboration. And also, just to be provocative for a moment, if we were to make the assertion, the assertion that uh, we wanted to see more amalgamation in our sector. If we were all for-profit entities to do that, we'd be talking about mergers and acquisitions, right? And in that model, if I was running a company that was going to acquire others, I would accrue a large war chest of funds to be able to then transact that merger. I would have my advisors, I would make sure that we've aligned everything and we've got the capital to be able to actually roll out that transaction successfully. But in a nonprofit setting, that might not be the case. What capital do we have set aside for those sort of strategic, important um, initiatives when our, when our funding might be tied to very specific programs? So the question that we might then be posed with is, what do I stop doing in order to then be able to pursue some of this collaboration or even amalgamation? And that's very challenging. So what if, what if there was a really progressive foundation that said, I'd be willing to provide you with some funding to be able to pursue that work? What could that unlock? Um, I think that that would be a really interesting thing for us to consider as a sector. Um, but that is to say, some, in some instances, we need to be able to put the resourcing in place to be able to pursue this uh, more nimbly and more successfully. And I'd say also, um, if, if there was a forum like this, and I applaud this uh, working group around mental health, I think it's brilliant that funders are coming together to discuss the approach. Um, if we were to mirror that with our organization, Steve, you talked about this earlier, to have that forum where we are collaborative, that we are uh, aware of the successes and failures that we might have had in trying out this program and to pull those um, proven solutions across the country, like you were saying, Mary, I think that would be a really, uh, that would be time well spent, but it also can't come at the sacrifice of the programming that we're running right now to be able to do. Hmm. Interesting. So Erin, you've touched on, on a concept, which is um, that often funders are, uh, are giving grants to support programmatic activities on the ground. And yet there are so many other things that organizations, mental health organizations, for example, are, are doing just to, to, to maintain sort of a strategic approach to be able to do those things like, like partner, like collaborate, like advocate that often are not necessarily supported. Um, so maybe Steve, if you want to start us off, can you speak to the, the sort of the need to support not only programs and activities on the ground, um, but also core capacity and, and how funders can be more conscious of not just looking at, you know, that's like the number of, of, of clients served, but, but really the sort of the, the, the growth and capacity of the organizations and how they're becoming more effective and more sustainable. Yeah, I, I, think, <clears throat> I think this is an issue for both philanthropy and government. Um, I think for decades, we have really gotten away with um, uh, almost um, ignoring that a lot, you know, the vast majority of the work that's happening in our communities is being delivered by nonprofit organizations that are just on shoestring budgets, trying to, to tie things together and and really living from one year to the next. Um, and in many situations, what we find is that, you know, they, they are competing with each other for grants, competing uh, with each other for government funding. And at the end of the day, um, I, I, I totally understand it's survival, 
Uh, but you, you know, the, the initiatives get launched again and again and again and again. And you can almost predict that initiatives are going to be launched on a three-year cycle simply because folks like to fund something that's net new. And I say folks because it's both government and philanthropy. I've had numerous conversations with government who've said, sorry, I'm not going to fund something that's already there. It needs to be net new. And, it, and, and you know, I think it raises, it, this is part of the challenge of what we're, we're, we're trying to do here is that, you know, communities need these services. They need these resources. And really, we don't invest enough in the infrastructure that is required to deliver those services. We, we you know, invent, we, we don't look at a road and think twice about paving it every two years. And, and yet we do. You know, and, and we don't think about a bus and the need to, you know, repair it and maintain it. Um, but that's that's the reality of running these services. You need to be able to support um, administrative salaries. You need to support uh, technology upgrades. Um, you, you need to, to support the training that goes into, you know, you talk about, Mary talks about innovation. Well, innovation can only be implemented if there's a training way of, you know, a, 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 a budget to train people. Um, you know, in the province of British Columbia, we don't have, we don't even have a centralized training center. It's something that Foundry is trying to get off the ground this year. We don't have a centralized training center for basic mental health intervention training for folks. Um, yet that should be part of the infrastructure. And so I think that while we often look to government to try to fund that, we also understand that it needs to go beyond government. We need to think about how do we support, how does philanthropy come in as a partner where a nonprofit organization um, brings in the staff, the, the know-how, the 15, 20 years of experience of providing the service and philanthropy is viewed as a partner that brings funding in and it's funding for innovation, it's funding for infrastructure, and it's to support the community rather than the, the cause or that, that in, because right now, we really need to invest in social justice and we need to invest in the nonprofit organizations that are leading that work. And those are typically the organizations that are sort of at the, at the end of the line when it comes to funding. But the reality is that this is what we need to do. We know that now. If we're going to really make a difference to those mental health and substance use uh, issues, we need to invest in social justice. And so that is investing in the fiber of the community. And I think that that's where we're at right now for both government and philanthropy. Thank you, Steve. Mary, would love to hear your insights on how funders can think beyond just program delivery on the ground and not to discount that because that's also a very important part of that but if funders who want to have impact in in mental health on a large scale how they could think beyond just programmatic funding and maybe some examples of, of other types of investments mm -hmm. i think the the situation that we're finding ourselves in now with covid um has highlighted um and exacerbated the the challenges in in the not in the not for profit sector, just to name one. I mean, we, it has highlighted many challenges, and you know, I I think back to the twenty five years that I worked in the not for profit sector before coming to Bell eleven years ago, um, and what I witnessed and saw over that period of time, and then in my role here at Bell is an ever increasing degree of sophistication, um, talent, professionalism, uh, running not-for-profit organizations. And I really do believe that uh, now is the time for, for not-for-profits to you know, adopt a business-like approach to mergers and acquisitions, right? To to and because what that will do, it, and I know that is difficult, right? Because people who work in the not-for-profit sector um, are used to uh, working on passion and no money, and so the, the passion is so strong, um, the belief in what it, they're doing is 
that, that it is so important is so real that it is as difficult to uncouple that passion from the practicality of you know, merging in it, it, like type organizations into one organization, which would free up capital, right? The duplication of the back end of administration, of buildings, of advertising, marketing, promotion, et cetera, et cetera, the cost of fundraising, like you would free up capital. And, um, and I, I really, that is a call to action I believe that uh, it would be the, the, the not-for-profits who take up that challenge um, for, for the betterment of their clients um, will serve their clients better by, by doing so and in freeing up that capital to, in, to do that kind of investment that we're talking about. Um, in sustainability and regeneration. Um, so, you know, if there's a good thing that, that we can turn to this last period of time, it has been the tremendous amount of innovation and creativity that I have seen in organizations, not-for-profit and for-profit in adapting to this new reality. And if, you know, not-for-profits can continue and take that to the next level with that creativity and ingenuity with a client-centered approach, um, more great work could be done through fewer organizations, I grant you that, but more great work could be done. Um, and I think the role for, for philanthropy is to, to encourage and support that to encourage and support that. And I know, for example, in the last year, uh, much of our funding, not all, but much of our funding um, was no strings attached funding. Now that was very unusual for, for Bell, but these were unusual times. So that no strings, you know, what, what we would call discretionary funding, right? To use um, in, in a way that the organizations need um, the most was essential because of that rapid adaptation that, that needed to go on. And, you know, and I think as funders, you know, we need to both encourage that collaboration or synergies between like-minded uh, organizations and through our philanthropy, support those who are leading that charge and doing that work. Um, and, and also to really consider and rethink how we fund uh, mm -hmm. to the point of, you know, some of those things that aren't tied to specific numbers of people um, being served, right? Well, in order for more people to be served, you need the technology, you need the, uh, you know, e-mental help, you need all these things. Um, so I, I think we can play a role in both supporting those nonprofits in, in not-for-profits in uh, you know, creating that kind of uh, healthier um, streamlined sector and uh, reward them through our philanthropy. Can I give an example of that, Mary? Mm -hmm. you, you know, Mary approached us with Foundry with um, with an opportunity to work with Bell, and you know, Mary, to her credit, and aligning with what she just said, said, you know, Steve, how how could you use you know, x x number of dollars? And I said, well, Mary, you know, to be honest, we're at a stage in our development where we really need to do a quality improvement cycle. Mm -hmm. We really need to understand how we can do better at what we're doing. In other words, I think we're inefficient. In certain in certain places, particularly in wait times, when it comes to young people getting access same day of right, and you know for for a, a foundation or to or for a funder to say, okay, that makes sense, you know, instead of going the, in a different direction and saying, well, we want something that's net new and we want to see something that's really flashy that we can kind of hide, yeah, quality improvement makes a lot of sense because of where you're at and that and it's the kind of funding quite honestly that the nonprofit sector doesn't have 
quality improvement is expensive. It's something that often is, is highly technical. Um, and, it's, and it's often not just one position, it's a bunch of people working together. And so to have that opportunity to approach Bell and to have that conversation was really critical. Um, and it doesn't happen very often. And so I think that that opportunity to have unrestricted, and, and I, I'll call it patient money, not patient as in the people we serve, but patient as in we'll be patient with you because we understand and we trust that you're, so, and I think trust comes into the conversation is that as true partners, there should be a trust. And so when you look at, as, a, as any donor or philanthropic organization, when you look at the reporting out that's expected from a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. partner, ask yourself whether it's reflective of the trust level that they are hey. hoping to have in that partnership. Because what I will say is that it's clear working with some partners that there isn't that trust. And then with others, there is. And I think that, that that's something that, that we all need to keep in mind is that for the most part, for the most part, our organizations are doing everything possible and more. And sometimes the, the level of reporting is so onerous that quite frankly, in our case, there are some organizations we won't apply to for funding because it's just so onerous to report out. And it feels like there's going to be a mistrust or distrust there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think often this is kind of termed as the idea of investing in activities versus investing in organizations, right? And the difference between those two things. And maybe, Aaron, if you want to close the loop for us on this one, you know, what in, in what ways does, you know, discretionary or unrestricted funding enable you to have greater impact on mental health specifically? Absolutely. And I, I have this donors uh, quip in the back of my mind. We once had a, a fellow say to us, uh, I'm, I'm ready to give you this, this amount of money, to which the fundraiser immediately said, great, which program might we direct this to? So it's all on us as well. We do it habitually and we should stop that. But he said, for me to, to direct it towards a specific program would be like me investing, buying shares in Apple and telling them it can only be used to produce iPhones. <laughs> we don't have that same mindset when we invest in for-profit, for example. And so that will always stick with me uh, because it was a little bit disarming for us to have such a perspective from a donor. But I'd also say, you know, beware the proposal that you receive that doesn't have a, an allocation towards administrative support and oversight and evaluation and to Steve's point, training. Because if it's not there either, it's not gonna happen or someone else is subsidizing that gift. So if you want that program to be successful and have partnership and be evaluated, then please also make sure that that's part of what you're funding, otherwise, who else's gift should I use to be able to provide that service for you? And so there is so much we can do with, I like this idea of patient capital, uh, Mary. There's so much we can do with undesignated money that will allow us to report on the full mandate of the organization and the outcomes that we're having. It does mean that that funder was a part of our total success. Sometimes we're looking for that one liner that says this money helped us reach that many young people, but maybe that's missing the point entirely. And so when we look into what does innovation look like in an organization, well, rarely is it a very straight line. It's not, it's a, not a linear approach. It involves us trying new things. It involves us consulting with young people. I'll use an example. We, we pitched a, a program to a donor, uh, which they uh, decided to fund. And it was for our artificial intelligence navigation technology. So if a young person comes to our website, there's actually a helpful little AI enabled bot that can help them navigate to what the best resources or the most likely resources to fit their needs might be. Again, speaking to supporting uh, client navigation or patient navigation. And when we launched that, or that plan, we had all sorts of ideas of what that would look like. But when we consulted young people, they told us all sorts of things that materially changed the plan. 
And so we had this wonderful partnership with our funder. So we were able to communicate those changes as we went. But if we were really locked into a particular proposal or funding agreement, there would be no room for us to pivot that. And then we would be positioned to place, do we continue with something that we know might be subpar, might not have the maximum impact, but be able to resource it fully to completion? Or um, is there another way forward? So maybe I'll stop there and, and turn it over to my peers, but I think this is a, a wonderful conversation to be had. And maybe there's an approach that allows for both. Maybe there's a portion of your support that goes to undesignated to allow for that flexibility, to allow for that investment in organizational success, and also something that is going towards a specific program for which you have a, a particular interest. It's not a zero sum game. Great, thank you, Erin. Um, I have lots more questions, but we actually have um, several from our participants. So I'm going to shift over there and, and just share some of the, the questions that have come up. So um, one is maybe I can combine Amy's question with Gilles' question. Um, and Steve, you, you've talked about this a little bit at the beginning about sort of the role of the convener. And I think both of these questions are alluding to sort of how can we actually enable greater collaboration you know, both between mental health organizations, but also between the community sector, government, private sector, all just getting all the stakeholders and the organizations to work together. What what is the role of philanthropy there? So I think, you know, Steve, you mentioned sort of the role of philanthropy as the convener. So maybe for those for those participants who are who are less familiar with that, maybe you could expand on that. And then and then maybe if someone else wants to speak to the role um, of, of philanthropy in, in funding collaboration, systemic work, systemic sort of collaboration work. So Steve, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so I'll take an example that I think Jill uh, gave is, you, you know, in a community where you have, whether it's seven or 70 organizations providing mental health services, the first question is, what is the experience of, of the folks in that community? So they may come back and say, please don't touch this. This is working really well. Or they may come back and say, I I need a roadmap. I, I don't understand where to go. And I'm still just walking into the hospital and someone is telling me where to go from there. So that'd be the first question I would have is, you, you know, understanding what the issues are without assuming. And I think sometimes we, we kind of assume um, without really hearing, you know, you, and that would mean engaging, you know, your, the population of interest that you may have, whether it's young people or families or older people, elders, even where they also have concerns, right? The next thing I would probably set out to do is get a sense of what is being offered in the community. So all those services that are working there, what is being offered? And then how does that start to map out in what we would call a stepped care model or, or where you're, you, you know, because what we learn when we do this, because this is part of our process in Foundry when we work in a, in a community, is that we often find that there's a big gap in the 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 less severe you know more prevalent presentations so that folks who are struggling with mild anxiety mild depression bumping up to moderate are really struggling to get any help and so they're waiting to fall off the cliff the proverbial cliff before they actually land in the hospital and get the help they need and so what we're finding is that you know as we get that resource map done we we see the gap and then it starts to to pivot the conversation towards, okay, what do we need to start to fill that gap? Um, and, and is there a way of allocating these resources in a, in a, um, in a, in a manner that's evidence-based and really starts to provide services at each step of the way? And then working with government to identify how resources can be shifted, how resources can be better allocated. If, if there's a service that absolutely is not being provided, is there a way of doing that virtually? Um, and that can be more, you know, like psychiatric services and determine and, and, um, and supports. Um, and then really starting to say, okay, how does that all link into say the acute care system, um, the hospitals, the emergency rooms, right? And just kind of lining this up. And I think that this is this is what we try to do in our communities now with mental health and substance use pathways, and now as we pivot into supportive employment as well. And it's just something that never seems to get done in communities. 
Um, but we wouldn't be able to do it if we didn't have the support of our philanthropic partners to basically pay for time for people to come together and do that work and to have those conversations and to really honor that folks do want to work together, but sometimes there just isn't anything that, that, that greases the skids, right? That moves things. And I think that that would be the approach I would take in a, in, in a place, um, in, a, in a community in New Brunswick. Great, thank you. Mary, do you want to add to that? I know, you know, you're, you're engaged in both funding work on the ground, but also funding, you know, efforts at the systems level. Maybe I'm not the post-secondary work that you've done comes to mind, but can you can you talk about how how foundations can fund that collaboration at the at the highest sort of levels of the system? Well, you know, I think we sometimes can overcomplicate things. You know, where there's a will, there's a way. If we want to collaborate, we will collaborate. You know, and 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 so it really is about our our you know ability to to uh, put our our patients and cl and clients and those we're serving right in the center and figure out what is going to be best you know for them for them and where there's a will there's a way and you know one of the things that I've observed again through this period of chaos um, we have seen as I, I said before, creativity and ingenuity. And we have seen governments and ourselves and many others investing more money in mental health um, and, and particularly in virtual delivery uh, of, of mental health services. And, and you know, I, 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 I feel that if we can take this moment in time and invest all of us where the will, where there's a will, there's a way, right? With the corporations, individuals, and governments invest more build, and, and build on what has the new funding that has been put in place as a result of COVID and keep it there and grow it as traditional uh, service delivery comes back on, on stream. You know, this is not going to solve all the problems, but the combination is additive of the in, 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 virtual services with the you know in-person services coming back online will increase access the availability of services in a very significant fashion and that that is not about you know creating the new fancy shiny object that that's that is ready and available and and in front of us and i believe you know the that the decisions we take now will have a direct impact and in terms of how we work together will have a direct impact on how well and how quickly we we recover from the pandemic when it comes to how mentally healthy we are at the end of it great thank you mary um so maybe another Two questions I'll combine. So um, one question from Desiree on on um, the high rates of suicide in Canada, followed by New Zealand and Greenland. To what extent um, is this disproportionate impact uh, related to Indigenous youth and, and how Indigenous youth are faring? And then maybe as a follow up, how do communities of support, how do we build communities of support for underserved population groups that have urgent needs for mental health care? So maybe starting with how Indigenous communities have been disproportionately impacted by mental health issues and maybe expanding to how funders can play a role in, 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 in supporting underserved groups. Mm, Aaron. <laughs> Great, I had my finger ready to go, Vani. Um, <laughs> uh, we have lots to say on, about this issue at Kids Help Phone. I'd say, first of all, I would be speculating to um, say that the experience of New Zealand and Greenland would be similar to that of Canada, but I can say for sure that the youth suicide rate in Canada amongst Indigenous youth is many times greater than non-Indigenous or settler, settler youth in Canada. There is a study that's, that's quoted that says that it's six times greater. Kids Help Phones uh, real-time data would suggest that that is much larger, uh, but we don't need to, to get into the specifics of that right now. It is signaling to us that more must be done and it needs to be done in that culturally competent way that both Steve and Mary have talked about in this conversation. 
And Kids Help Phone has made a commitment. Um, we have a strategy and I encourage anyone who wants to see it to either reach out to me or see it on our website. It's called Finding Hope. And that was something that was uh, created with full participation with Indigenous young people and ind Indigenous trusted adults and experts um, under the OCAP principles, et cetera, to create a strategy that would be able to provide that equity and access to Indigenous young people in Canada. And also, when we saw during this pandemic, many crises unfolding one on top of another, including the reckoning that has come as a result of the murder of George Floyd and the experience that we've had in Canada as well. When Kids Help Phone looked at that real-time information that we had from young people, we saw that of those that young folks that reached out to us for support, the, those who cited racism were the second most distressed out of any young person that reaches out to us. They were second only to those who feared imminent harm in their own home. So when we think about the impacts that racism has in our country and how that is related to mental health, let's be clear, this is, this is urgent, it is life and death, and more must be done. Um, there's lots more that I can say on that issue, but I feel like these solutions need to be made in partnership with community. They cannot, can't be done for communities without them. Um, and that's a principle that Kids Help Phone commits to. And I know, uh, Mary, you would expect that from us. Steve, I'm sure that's something that's built into your program development. Um, but it also behooves us to partner with community groups that have already been set up. And so this is about how or, or our organization can be an ally with another organization that is maybe focused in that group, maybe has the ear of the young people, for example, that we're trying to reach. And so there's huge benefit and efficiency for us to partner with them um, to create that solution together. And um, I would encourage any organization that you're investing in that says that they're creating a specific strategy for a focused community, ask them who they're doing it with and ask them how that community was involved in the development. And also ask questions like, how are you weaving that into your governance? Do you have representation on your board, for example? because that will be the thing that keeps you on track as that, that, that program is unfolded. Oh, you're on mute, Bonnie. That had to happen at least once. Um, Steve, I know this is a, a passion area for you as well. Is there anything you'd like to add about sort of what can be done to build up support for underserved groups and, and maybe the specific role of philanthropy? Yeah, I think I think that there's, um, you, you know, one, one thing I'll, I'll say is that what we've learned from our Indigenous partners and in, in, in understanding the data around suicide is that, you know, we, we have hundreds of communities. And just like our settler communities, um, not each community is impacted the same way. And so we, we just have to caution around, you know, you know using a, a brush to paint everyone the same. Um, and, and, and I think that that's something that we certainly understand is that we have some very strong um, partners who will say, you know, please don't, don't assume that we have high suicide rates um, in, our, in our First Nations because we don't. Um, that, that's not a, an issue for us. And so I think that's just one of the lessons that we have learned um, around um, this. And, and I think that um, it's really important, I think at this moment in time, to fund First Nations organizations, whether they're not for profit or um, you know, for profit, in, in to, to look at supporting them um, to do the work that they wanna do. Um, and their funding cycles are, are um, maddeningly um, um, similar to our nonprofit organizations. Um, when you think about an Aboriginal Friendship Center, um, why are they working off a cycle of funding? Aboriginal Friendship Centers are core, core 
uh, services to our urban uh, indigenous populations, yet they go from sometimes year to year in terms of their funding. And it's critical to ensure that they have the funding that they need to do the work. Um, and I think that this is something that we've come to understand. And, and I think Aaron is, is um, his point is, is so critical in terms of the impact that racism is having on our young people. Um, there are lots of organizations out there who have a long-standing history of working in the social justice environment. And we have to be careful that we don't fund organizations that see this as an opportunity. And so mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important that questions be asked of, around that. Um, I think governance is important. I think you, you know their HR strategies yeah, are um, is also important. Um, and understanding what they what they see as as their needs organization because I think there's also this moment in time as Mary talks about where we aren't only needing to build an infrastructure but we're we're needing to build in um, time and resources for really challenging conversations. Mm -hmm really challenging conversations. And we have to understand that by hosting and supporting organizations and communities to have those organizations, we will make this country stronger. We will, we will support our nations to be stronger. And you know that has an impact, that will have a downstream impact on mental health. Um, but it's not something that's top of mind for folks in terms of, okay, well, how do we bring people together in a community forum and start to think about how do we address the, the longstanding issues of racism, the longstanding issues of social inequity, of, of indigenous, um, you, you know, uh, of settler history um, and indigenous genocide. And I think that, that those are conversations that we we need to have now. Um, and we and we can say, well, we're coming out of the pandemic. What's the big deal? We're through it. But we're not. We're not. I think the pandemic has just basically pulled the curtain back in Canada and has said, well, this is we've known this has been here. And now we really know it's here. Um, my kids who are 10, 12 and 14 keep asking really interesting questions um, around how is it possible that this is in Canada? How is it possible that this is our, our history? How is it? And I think that we really need to think about how as a philanthropic sector, how a philanthropic sector can support having those conversations so we do get to a place of reconciliation. Great, thank you, Steve. And if, if I recall correctly, this coming up in a, in a past conversation in general is that, you know, for those foundations who want to support work in mental health, sometimes that comes from working with you know, funding a mental health organization. And sometimes that comes from funding just a community-based organization. So many of organizations working in community may not have a specific mandate around mental health, but because they're out there, they're working with community members, whether it's, you know, uh, Native Friendship Centers, whether it's Boys and Girls Clubs, community centers, so many organizations out there, uh, grassroots groups are, are connecting, they're reducing social isolation, they're, you know, they're creating a greater sense of belonging and they are addressing mental health through those beings. So I think that's maybe something else to, to keep in mind. Um, so I'm gonna last two questions. Um, so one is around data um, and maybe I will direct this one at Erin. So, um, so from Sandy, mental health remains widely underreported, particularly in lower income communities where data is more scarce and which results in less attention and treatment for mental health disorders. What kind of data would be important for funders to keep in mind to help us decide which projects and initiatives and groups we should support to fill those social and health gaps that were mentioned? So I know Kids Health is doing a ton of work around data. Can you speak to some of the most useful and relevant metrics that you think could help guide funding decisions? That's a great question. And I'm sure uh, my colleagues on the panel will have lots to say on that as well. <laughs> Um, let me just briefly paint you a, a picture of what we're working with here at Kids Help Phone. Last year alone, we had over 4.6 million connections with young people. So in terms of the quantity of data in a single year, um, that's what we're drawing from, including, of course, the years previous to that. Um, we are, there's a number of ways that we collect the data. I, I won't get into that here, but again, I'm, I'm happy to elaborate at another point. But when we ask young people to tell us what's, um, uh, what's concerning them, they're honest with us. In fact, 73% uh, of all of the young people that reach out to us have told us something that they've never shared with another single person ever. In many ways, that makes us 
the front door, the first folks that they are speaking to about the challenges they're having, which gives us a glimpse that we feel is something that we need to share broadly with the sector, because there may be uh, other services that are going to be essential to that young person later on in their journey or at some point in that cycle that needs to hear who's reaching out to us from where with what issues. We also are now doing more to collect some of that demographic information. So I'll be honest to say, when we started collecting data in the first place, we didn't ask questions about uh, what race that young person identified uh, as. Now we are starting to do that, which gives us a much more uh, clarity as to um, how we might be able to serve those communities better. But I know there's still gaps. So I can't say that Kids Help Phones data set is so perfect that we could be able to tell you about the specific concerns of all communities, because maybe we're not actually, we don't have the right cultural competency for that group. We don't have the level of trust with that particular organization. So one question I'd ask as a funder is, what data are you using to inform this program development that you're telling me about? And are, is there data from other organizations that you've included? So what consultation have you done with other groups to draw upon uh, their success. I encourage all organizations to access Kids Help Phones data, for example, to say, um, and you can isolate by province even, you can say young people in BC between the ages of uh, eight and 12 are talking to Kids Help Phone more about eating disorders and body image than any other uh, province in Canada. And so you could incorporate some of those themes into the, the services that you offer young folks. And um, without sounding like a, a commercial, all of that is publicly available on our website under our data insights tab, which um, I encourage you to explore. Great. So I'm gonna move us to our closing question um, and I'm gonna start with Mary. So what is, okay, so I'll, I'll frame this as someone who's already a funder. So for someone who's been in this space and, and uh, both on the fundraising side and on the fund giving side for, for, for uh, quite some time, what is your wish list or advice for, um, for foundations who are thinking about funding in this area? Like what would you advise them to do based on your experience? Well, I think the, the easiest thing would be, and, and a very practical step would be to get in touch with the MH WAG, find out what it does. And <laughs> so that's a commercial for MH WAG, but um, find out what it does, learn about what, what you know, educational opportunities there are to learn about the players and the sectors, to find out, be able to collaborate with other organizations, learn about projects that, you know, one funder hears about that another might not, but to see opportunities. So find out about MHWAG and see if it's a good fit for you because it's a really big tent and the more people, the more funders who, who are part of it, the better the chances are that we will make good quality decisions, strategic, you know, collaborate at, that will ultimately end up in improving the mental health and well-being of all Canadians. So I, 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 I don't know who's going to get that call. But uh, I actually, I think I do know. <laughs> but, uh, um, I think that would be absolutely the first, the first and easiest step to take. Great, thank you, Mary. More info on that, I promise you all by the time we end this call. Um, Steve, what is your wish list for philanthropic engagement in the mental health sector? Um, I, I think I've mentioned it, but I'll say it again. You know, view yourself as a partner. Um, and so if you're viewing yourself as a funder, the folks who get funded by you will experience you as a funder. Um, so they will try to please you um, and they will try to um, answer your questions and your reports in a way that they think you, will make you happy. Um, if you're a partner, then um, it allows for vulnerable conversations. It allows for folks to feel like they can trust you and it will lead to far greater impact um, and I think that that's, you know, one, one, of, one of my partners, uh, one of my philanthropic partners had said in front of other foundations, you know, when was the last time you did a site visit? Um, you, you know, 
COVID willing, but when was the last time that you became curious to understand how your money was being used, how um, meeting with folks to understand the impact that it had, um, meeting with folks to understand the challenges that they're faced with day to day and how your money may actually be contributing to more challenges and more inequity. Um, you you want to find that out. And so I think my wish list would be to just impart that there is a great deal of power that is wielded by both government and philanthropy because of, of the, the, the financial aspect. And it's, it's the responsibility of both government and philanthropy to ensure that that power is not felt as an inequity, um, but it is felt as a true gift and that, um, that it's brought in as a resource rather than a way of, um, uh, of creating a power uh, imbalance. Thank you, Steve. And Erin, maybe one, one wish or piece of advice for foundations thinking about funding in the area of mental health. I mean, I think I'll, I'll echo both. I, Mary, your comment, it, I was just thinking, you know, if you do this in isolation, if you make this choice around funding in isolation, but expect collaboration on the other side, there's probably a disconnect there. And so some of us like to think of, of giving as being something very private. And the choice to give may be private or the focus area, but I encourage you when you're when you're then entering the moment where you will fund an organization, maybe that's where more collaboration amongst your funding peers and amongst organizations will actually help us have better outcomes. Great, thank you. Thank you all three of you so much. It's been just a, a real pleasure to have this conversation and I can't wait until COVID is all done and everybody is vaccinated and then we can actually do it in person one day together. Um, so thank you very much to our panelists for taking the time. Thank you to our participants. We're sorry we weren't able to get to every single question. There were a lot of good ones, um, but I think it warrants maybe another session sometime in the future. And, you know, I'd like to make Mary the official spokesperson of the MHWAG, um, but just as a final sort of pitch, there is a funding collaborative group for organizations who want to fund in this area. It includes those who've been funding in the area for decades, as well as those who are just getting started. So Jihan will send out the information. Um, the contact person is Gohar at the Grand Beck Foundation. She'd be happy to have a conversation with you or share some information. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you for your interest in this area. I think it's just so great to see so many funders who are interested in and, and really dedicated to impact in the mental health sphere. And um, uh, that's, just, that's just great. So have a wonderful day. <laughs>